climate change, as we all know, is a huge global issue. 16% of clean tech innovation resides right here in Toronto. I know there is immense talent and women are just looking for opportunities to bring their talent forward. I am so proud that the City of Toronto has been a catalyst in supporting women as emerging leaders in fighting and tackling climate change issues. The mentors in the Women for Climate program were matched with a mentee. My journey with Anam Khan has opened my eyes to the next generation of women who are definitely going to help usher in a more sustainable future. And each mentor provided their own expertise. I wanted to share my insights, my journey, and my expertise, as well as to shape the leaders of tomorrow. I care. I have a long history in environmental matters, especially climate change issues. One-on-one -on -one coaching, motivation. If I've helped nurture her gifts and her belief in herself, how rewarding is that? Inspiration and guidance throughout the program, right through to the final pitch. To address climate change, we need all voices at the table, and that includes women. I'm so hopeful that this program will make space for women at the table and make them feel welcome. The ideas and the businesses proposed by the women participating in this program will help us to meet our objectives of being net zero by 2050 or sooner. The City of Toronto has ambitious plans under Transform TO to decrease our greenhouse gas emissions and under our resilience strategy to prepare for the impacts of climate change. I encourage all women to apply for this exciting program. It's a great way to improve their ideas by learning from experts and also join an international network of women committed to action on climate change. Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the Women for Climate Mentorship Program Earth Day celebration. Happy Earth Day. My name is Candice Batista. I'm an environmental journalist, and I will be your host tonight. We've got a lovely evening planned, and of course, the exciting reveal where we will be announcing the winner of the city's pitch competition and a $20,000 award. But first, I would like to introduce City Councillor Jennifer McKelvey for Scarborough Rouge Park, Chair of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee for Toronto's Land Acknowledgement. Thank you, Candace. The City of Toronto acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. The city also acknowledges that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas, Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Thank you, Jennifer. Before we dive in a little bit more about you, you are the Mayor's Environment and Resilience Champion, the Chair of the City's Infrastructure and Environment Committee, and the Co-Champion of Women for Climate TO. Prior to being elected, you were an environmental geoscientist and have a PhD in geology. Councillor McKelvey was supported by the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Fellowship and for 10 years worked as a senior scientist at the Nuclear Waste Management Organization and a research director at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. We're so happy that you are with us tonight, Jennifer. Well, thank you. We're likewise so happy that you're joining us. Yay! <laughs> so let's talk a bit about this program. It was developed in partnership with C40 Cities, which connects city practitioners and mayors around the world to enable stronger collective climate action. Can you tell me how this partnership came to be? Well, really, we have Heather Taylor, our Chief Financial Officer, who's, who's here with us today to, to thank for this. I was on my way to Copenhagen for the C40 Summit, and that is a gathering of leaders from uh, the mega cities of the world that are working together for climate action. And so when I was on my way out the door, pretty much, um, Heather said, you really have to learn about women for climate. And while I was at the Copenhagen conference, I listened in on the session on women for climate, as this is a C40 initiative. And I heard from Mayor Aki Sawyer, who's the champion of that program. She's the mayor of Freetown. And she was talking about the great work that she's doing in Sierra Leone. And I was inspired by her. And really the whole program is this network of international women coming together for climate action. And so Heather was right. It was something we absolutely had to do in Toronto. And I'm so delighted that I'm co-championing that with her and we're joining 16 other cities internationally. And here in Canada, we're joining Montreal and Vancouver. 
Wow, it's amazing. You, you're all doing such wonderful work. And it's really great to see Toronto's engagement in climate action on a global scale. Um, how does the Women for Climate program help advance the city of Toronto's uh, climate goals? Well, in 2019, uh, Toronto signed the Climate Declaration, and we signed that alongside 800 other cities in 16 countries to advance our emission targets to be net zero by 2050 or sooner. And so here in Toronto, we have several different strategies and programs that are going to help us get there. Uh, the first is Transformatio, and that's looking at how we decrease our greenhouse gas emissions in the city. So these are things like our solar panel programs, our energy reduction programs, our green buses. Uh, Toronto now has the largest fleet of green buses in North America. Um, and it also includes our resilience strategy, which is looking at how we're preparing for the impacts of climate change, um, because we do know that we're already feeling those impacts impacts here today. And in the city, we also have lots of exciting programs at looking how we're reducing our use of single uh, single use items um, and disposable items and reducing our waste management. So all of the programs that uh, were developed through this program the, by the 12 mentees are contributing in some way to those exciting initiatives here at the city. So exciting. I mean, there, we're, we're doing so many um, great things and obviously today is Earth Day. It is the 51st Earth Day. Why was it important to make the announcement today on Earth Day? Well, firstly, I'm sad we're not outside together. Right? I know. <laughs> it's, it's cold outside and it was a little bit flurry early and it's not Earth Day unless you have cold weather. Um, but unfortunately, while we can't be outside together planting trees, I'm really excited that we have this way to be together virtually. And Earth Day has a special place in my heart. When I was a teenager, uh, back in high school, I helped to organize the first flag, uh, Earth Day flag raising at the Scarborough Civic Center. And um, so I'm really excited that, you know, many, many, won't say how many years later, um, you know, I'm still participating in Earth Day events. And we launched on World Environment Day last year in June. So I think it's very fitting that we're announcing this cohort uh, today here on Earth Day. I feel the same way. It's such a Earth Day is such a poignant time. I mean, if you know me, you know that I, I'm pretty much Earth Day is every day for me. <laughs> um, well, the mayor is a very strong advocate, of course, we know for climate action. And I understand we have a message from the mayor of Toronto, John Tory. That's right. He was disappointed that he couldn't be here with us today. He very much enjoyed the networking event that we had uh, just a couple months ago, and he was at that. Um, in this earlier today, I joined him at an announcement for the ravine strategy. So he wanted to be here in person, but couldn't to thank the mentors, all the jurors, um, and thank all the staff that also participated in this program. So I will do that. I am going to give a big shout out to Daniela Marchese and Angie Camara that have been running this program here in Toronto, um, but also thank uh, Nancy Rusica and Jessica Chow who organized tonight's event. And uh, he did send along a lot of message, so I'm happy to um, let you roll that tape and hear what he has to say. Hello, Mayor John Tory here. Today is Earth Day, and while we'd normally be out planting trees in a park or out facilitating our annual citywide spring cleanup, this year must once again be different. While we're unable to gather in person to mark the occasion because of the pandemic, I do want to take a moment to speak to the ways in which your city is protecting our environment and making Toronto a more sustainable and resilient city. Toronto's climate action strategy, it's called Transform TO, and it will ultimately change how we live and how we work and how we build in our city over the next 30 years. The strategy will see Toronto become a carbon neutral city and a healthier, more equitable and prosperous city as we take action to reduce carbon pollution. An updated strategy that aligns with Council's target to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or sooner will be presented to the City Council later this year. And I'm proud that Toronto's reputation as an international leader on climate action has grown to include membership in the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance and C40, which is a network of the world's megacities committed to addressing climate change. But we know we still have a very long way to go and a lot of hard work ahead. So what more is the city doing? Well, we're committed to leading by example. We're installing building automation systems, conserving energy and undertaking lighting and water efficiency retrofits in city owned buildings. We're planning for new net zero community centers and a net zero civic center right here in Etobicoke. We have a hundred rooftop solar installations on city owned buildings across Toronto 
with more to come. We're testing an innovative solar-powered battery backup power system at an EMS emergency medical services station in the east end of Toronto. Projects like these not only reduce carbon pollution from city operations, but they, they build resilience for some of our most critical services. The city has its first electric vehicle strategy, and the first on-street EV charging stations are now in place on residential streets with more to come. And we have, you may not know this, we have the largest fleet at present of electric buses in all of North America. There are countless more ways in which the city is spearheading novel and innovative solutions to ensure that we're doing our part to tackle climate action. And of course, I want to thank Torontonians who every day are assisting us with these efforts by changing their behavior, just making some changes in their own lives, making improvements to their own homes, doing things differently, taking initiatives of their own. We know that the time for action is now. We have no time to waste. And I can assure you, that we are working tirelessly to ensure that Toronto's pandemic recovery is a green one. Thank you very much for all you're doing and happy Earth Day. So awesome. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, we wish you were here, but we're so appreciative for the message. Now to discuss the customized Women for Climate TO mentorship program, I would like to introduce the City of Toronto's CFO and Treasurer, Heather Taylor, and co-champion of Women for, for Women for Climate TO. In this role, she provides oversight of an annual $13 billion operating budget, a $40 billion capital budget, and is one of the fastest growing cities in North America, long-term financial sustainability is imperative for Toronto to recover, adapt, and thrive. Under Heather's leader leadership in June, the City of Toronto was also the first Canadian government to introduce a social debenture program and issue a social bond. Coupled with the city's green bond program, this action demonstrates the city's leadership and ongoing commitment to sustainable finance by promoting positive and equitable socioeconomic outcomes. Welcome, Heather. It's so wonderful to have you this evening. It's lovely to be here and it's nice to see you. Yes, you too. So um, I'm so excited to talk with you. You do such great work. Let's talk a little bit about how the city customized the Women for Climate program for Toronto mentees. Sure. I, you've heard uh, from Councillor McKelvey and the mayor that we actually took the concept of the program from C40. And from there, we, we looked at our own climate change action plan, the Transform TO plan that the mayor just uh, commented on. And we decided that we really wanted to highlight the talent that was in Toronto. We really wanted to take the ingenuity and the innovation that we knew existed. And so that's where we started working with stakeholders and saying, how can we help this talent develop? And we co-created knowledge labs that helped the individuals that were chosen to build business plans, build communication strategies and come together to create a new network, a new network of women. And, and as Councillor McKelvey talks about having a seat at the table to tackle a global issue of climate change. So we developed knowledge labs and we had experts come in and walk the mentees through different aspects of how to bring their ideas to life. And these, these knowledge labs that we called it were co-created and we really did get the benefit of watching each of the mentees grow throughout the program. Wow, so excited. And I imagine your inaugural cohort was impressive. Um, how would you describe the mentees and their projects? So as, and just as the program evolved, we knew we wanted to do some form of competition to reward the mentees. And uh, I'm, the mentees themselves were going to participate in an overall pitch. Um, so we would look at the growth of those mentees because I can tell you that the talent that was at the table was fantastic. They brought some really, really innovative ideas from wide ranges of the spectrum. Everything from textiles to waste reduction to carbon reduction to rainwater and resiliency projects. The great thing was there was two common denominators amongst all our mentees. One was obviously their immense passion to fight climate change, but really their desire to make a difference in this world through their innovation. So it's incredibly impressive and inspirational. 
Yeah, I can imagine, and I'm sure very hard to uh, to choose a winner. We'll talk to the jury um, uh, just a little bit later. So the city decided to create a pitch competition following the program, and the award is twenty thousand dollars to support their project. Um, that's pretty amazing. So what did the competition look like? Okay, so I need to clarify first that there is a big purse of twenty thousand dollars, but it comes from amazing sponsors. So we worked with amazing sponsors throughout this program, and I really do want to say thank you to them. We were we worked really hard with RBC. We worked really hard with Alice Dawn, EY, and Toronto Life, and our they are the generous supporters of this program and of the financial support for us to be able to offer a twenty thousand dollar prize. So I have to clarify, it's not City of Toronto money, just in case anybody was wondering, but. Um, the competition, we knew that we wanted to prepare people for the real world. We wanted to get them to bring their ideas to life and get them ready to speak to investors. And so the pitch we felt if we emulated the Dragon's Den experience would give them the experience that they needed to, to speak to investors in a way that they would not have had the opportunity to um, otherwise. And so we created for them uh, and partnered with them to create videos that help them present their ideas in a succinct way. They also created business plans and financial plans that they submitted to the jury. And then we had 15 minutes with each mentee. And in that 15 minutes, they did an actual presentation. And then they had 10 minutes. We only had 10 minutes of, of questions and answers. And I can tell you it went by like 30 seconds as if it it was just incredible. We spent the weekend doing it and I can tell you, I can, I think I can speak on the behalf of other jurors that we were just blown away by how much growth and development had happened over the year, but how they really polished their ideas and made them appear to be uh, feasible and scalable and ready to make a difference. So I'm confident, although we only have one winner, we are going to see these women's names in business and ideas in months, years to come. I'm sure I can't wait. It's such an exciting time and what a great experience for all of them um, to be able to bring their um, sustainable ideas to the table in front of an amazing, uh, such an amazing board. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, before we announce the winner, we'd like to acknowledge the jury for the pitch competition. Heather and Jennifer, I understand that you were joined by Yulia Maria Becker from RBC's Sustainability Group, Jason Maganoy from Toronto Life and Canadian Business, as well as Courtney Smith, who's actually here with us today. Tonight, Courtney is the founder and CEO of Nurture, a social app that allows users to integrate and connect based on their shared love of video. Welcome, Courtney. Hi. Thank How you. Are you? Good. Happy Earth Day. Yes. Happy Earth Day to you. Um, it's so lovely to to meet you virtually. Um, so I'm sure you had so many great ideas during that pitch competition. What was it like for you being on the jury? Honestly, it was wonderfully weird. Um, it gave me a real perspective on how tough it is to judge a business and to judge founders, especially when there are so many great ideas and so many great founders with so much potential to really change the world. And I really saw a lot of heart and passion and dedication and enthusiasm um, in every single person's pitch and I'd say the most important thing and like the coolest thing above all is it was so cool to see all this innovation coming from Toronto. And so that made me just like incredibly proud. Yeah, I mean, there's some really awesome women out there, aren't there? <laughs> Including yourself. Now you're actually an entrepreneur um, yourself. So how did that impact your point of view? I'm sure that that had something to do with how you approached, how you, how you looked at things. Definitely similar to all these women, I'm also the one who's usually having to pitch my business to a jury of investors. So I know how nerve wracking that can be, but I have to say I was pretty impressed with everyone and they really came with their A game. And I'm a very pragmatic person and a very pragmatic entrepreneur. And that really allowed me to look at everyone's business with a realistic point of view and not just an idealistic one. 
And I've been forced as an entrepreneur to think about my business in a lot of different ways, including <clears throat> making sure my business can optimize for scale, the long-term growth plan, and, you know, making sure I have a strong product, product market fit. So I'd say that having gone through that already as an entrepreneur, it really helped me in analyzing everyone's pitch. And I think also so many things come up when you're an entrepreneur that you don't expect. And I think giving um, giving these women the opportunity to kind of go through that was it really difficult to choose a winner. It must have been. Oh, my gosh. Yes, definitely. Um, <laughs> yeah, it really was really just because there were so many different types of businesses with different strengths and also in different areas. And there were some that were, you know, really at the very early stages, but their business had a really massive potential for growth. And then there were other businesses that were further along, but they had kind of really strong local applications. And so for me, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart and I am an entrepreneur. So I always look for the business opportunities that can scale the most, those I find to be the most enticing. And so there was something for everyone. It was really hard to pick. And I just want to say also, I've heard, you know, so many no's in my life and in my career along the way. So regardless of today's outcome, um, I hope everybody will continue to work on building what it is that they love and will continue to pursue their passion and to really make a change in the world. Because from what I've seen, like everybody who was involved has the potential to like do really, really great things. I'm sure it was, it's uh, so unbelievably exciting. What do you think something like this means to all the young women being women? It's just such, firstly, it's such an incredible time in the world right now, like to go after what it is you want and to make a change. And it was just, I mean, it really did blow me away to see all of these women from Toronto just coming up with these ideas and having this like short amount of time to really like pitch it and, and really get everyone excited. And you can just see there's a shift happening in the world and people are finally really going after what they want and women finally have the confidence to do that. So for me, it was just like, I just loved it every minute. I love that. That's so wonderful. Well, I think we've reached that moment in the evening that we've all been waiting for. I'm going to turn things over to Courtney, Heather, and Jennifer for the big announcement. And it is a big announcement. And so I'm going, I'm going to do it on behalf of my fellow jurors. I am absolutely thrilled um, to share with you who this year's winner is. The very first city of Toronto Women for Climate pitch winner is someone who completely blew us away, completely blew us away with her energy, her passion, her confidence, but very importantly, the ability for her project to scale beyond just the city of Toronto, beyond the borders of Ontario, Canada, it will be able to be scaled globally. We were all as the jurors, we're very, very confident in, in the ability of this project to truly move forward. And so the recipient of the very first City of Toronto Women for Climate pitch competition is the founder and CEO of Still Solutions, Hilary Scanlon. Woo! Congratulations, Hilary! We are so excited. Hillary impressed us uh, throughout the program in all her uh, preparation materials, her video, her business plan was thorough. Her financial plan was so well done. And I will say that from a finance <laughs> perspective. Um, she, she worked with stakeholders and and co-created her product. She did research that was so in-depth. Uh, she did psychological research. She did product research. As Courtney was just mentioning, she knew her markets. She knew the opportunities. And as I said, that we were just really, really impressed with the ability of this project to be implemented. So the feasibility was there. The scalability was there. And we are very, very optimistic that this is a project that is going to go beyond just the city of uh, Toronto, beyond the borders of Ontario, but it is going to be 
largely and, and hugely successful. And there she is now, Hillary, congratulations. We have to all give you a round of applause. <laughs> Thank so you so much. Exciting. Thank We're you. So exciting. We're gonna speak to you in just a few minutes, but first we wanted to share a video that will provide all of you with some background on Hillary's incredible project. My name is Hillary Scanlon. I'm the founder and CEO of Still Solutions. Uh, we work to bridge the gap between sustainability and accessibility. I uh, lost my vision five years ago and started Still Solutions shortly after because I was becoming increasingly frustrated with the one, inaccessibility of the built environment, but two, the inaccessibility of environmental stewardship and waste disposal. Very Rarely are people with disabilities involved in either the discussions or the decision-making processes with regards to how to address it. And as a result, the solutions that are developed are often inaccessible um, to people with disabilities or to people of other marginalized identities. Well, the waste finder is a set of tactile indicators that go on the ground surrounding a waste container. They are both visual and tactile and they enable people of all abilities to dispose of their waste in public spaces. Once you implement the waste finder in your space, um, you can expect one diversion of waste from landfill. That's also gonna result in savings. One of the biggest obstacles was definitely the fact that um, my experience is my own and the solution that I'm gonna create is my own. Also one of our biggest assets was including people with one diverse types of visual impairments um, in the design process, but people with diverse uh, abilities. Uh, we also included since custodial staff in the design process, often they're left out of the design process. So we really wanted to make sure that every potential user that had the ability to be impacted by the waste finder in some way was involved. By implementing the waste finder in public spaces in the city of Toronto uh, would have a major impact on the community and the city. 22% um, of Canadians with, uh, have a disability. 4% uh, of Canadians have vision loss. So just those numbers alone, um, accommodating for those needs and those individuals would result in massive uh, impacts for the community. Um, the city of Toronto would benefit directly from those uh, waste finder products being implemented because it would divert waste from landfill. Uh, and it would also help them uh, advance their own sustainable development goal efforts. Well, unbelievable. We are back with Hillary Scanlon, Women for Climate Mentee, City of Toronto Pitch Competition winner and founder and CEO of Stilla Solutions. Hillary, congratulations once again. I'm so unbelievably happy for you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. How are you feeling right now? Um, I'm still a bit stunned, definitely. Um, I, I think that when $20,000 lands in your lap for, for any reason, it, it's one to be stunned, but I'm also uh, incredibly happy and humbled as the judges indicated. It was a, a tough competition and I, I knew that immediately once I met each of the attendees. Um, so, so very humbled by the experience as well. Well, it's very well deserved. Tell me a bit about your reaction when you found out you won. What were you doing when you found out? Well, it was funny because I I missed a call, the, the original call that had <laughs> indicated that I had won. And um, so I ended up going to bed and not being able to sleep for the entire night. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> So uh, when I woke up the next morning, um, I was able to to get the call from uh, Heather Taylor and um, she indicated that I had won and it was, I was, I was stunned, but then I, I also had to jump into another meeting in five minutes. So I was like, okay, keep it cool. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. But well, you I'm sure you did. So let's talk a little bit about um, your company. So you really are bridging the gap. And I love the way you phrase this on your website between sustainability and accessibility. Why is that? Why is sustainability and sustainability so important right now? 
Right. So um, climate change is at the top of everyone's mind um, with increasing, increasing climate disasters, climate emergencies, etc. And then with Earth Day being today, happy Earth Day, by the way. You too. Um, thanks. Thank you. Uh, people are starting to have those kind of crucial conversations um, as to how to address and mitigate its impacts. Unfortunately, um, a number of individuals are often excluded from those conversations. That includes women, uh, which is why uh, initiatives such as this are so great, but that also includes people with disabilities. As a result, many of the solutions that are developed and implemented within communities are inaccessible to people with disabilities. Uh, we wanted to change that by um, at least bridging that gap in one sector, and that's waste management. Um, so right now, waste management as it stands uh, kind of stands alone in the sustainability sector. It wasn't designed with uh, people with disabilities and accessibility in mind. So what we wanted to do was create a product that uh, enabled people with disabilities to enter that realm of sustainability and to participate in environmental stewardship, regardless of their ability to, um, to see, to walk, to hear, etc. It's so unbelievably inspiring. Tell us about Still Solutions. So what is it exactly? Sure. So um, as you said, we're a social enterprise, actually, that works to bridge the gap between sustainability and accessibility. Uh, social enterprise, as I define it, is um, a, a business that uh, really focuses on a quadruple bottom line, that of people, profit, planet, and purpose. Um, and so what we do is we provide uh, organizations with a product known as Waste Binder. And Waste Finder is a series of tactile indicators that are placed on the ground surrounding a waste container. And they enable individuals of all abilities to independently, one, locate uh, the location of a waste unit and to dispose of their waste once there. Um, yeah, it's a product that we, we designed using the seven principles of universal design. So it's not only a product that's accessible to people with disabilities, that enables them to identify, for instance, which, which stream to dispose of their waste. It's a product that really caters to um, a range of diverse backgrounds and experiences as well. It, um, we, we tried to account for as many identities as we could in the design process. I mean, uh, garbage is such a huge problem and recycling is so confusing um, for, for most people in general. So this is really helping to, to streamline that. How did you come up with the name Still Solutions? Can you tell me a bit about your name? Great question. <laughs> um, so this actually started as a, as a class project um, in 2017. Um, I, it was a, a class project I had asked one of my professors um, shortly after losing my vision unexpectedly during my undergrad, if he had any suggestions on how to make um, waste disposal more accessible, because I was tired of carrying around trash all day I'm um, sure. because I couldn't find a waste container. And unfortunately, he said, no, like, I have no solutions for you. Um, but that spurred me to uh, actually take it on as a project. And... I, I just remember that I needed to slap a name on it uh, as kind of soon as possible, classic kind of student trying to figure something at last minute. And from there, it just snowballed into becoming this um, federally incorporated business that, um, yeah, it was just a, a name that came up, uh, that I came up quickly uh, with, sustainability through an inclusive lens. And then it just somehow stuck because people got used to saying it. So I was thinking, like, I, I can't change it now. No, of course. <laughs> so how did you, um, what made you apply for, um, for, first of all, how did you find out about Women for Climate? And what made you then also apply? Yeah, so um, I found out about Women for Climate because I've been involved in a number of, or I've been trying to get involved in, in a number of, um, entrepreneur uh, and specifically social entrepreneur support programs and initiatives. So I actually got involved at the Center for Social Innovation, which is located in Toronto. Amazing place. Um, yes, and uh, got involved in one of their programs, uh, a joint program that's funded by the federal government, I believe the 
women, or sorry, the Ontario government, the Women of Ontario Social Enterprise Network. And it was through that um, program that I was introduced to this, this new program for City of Toronto residents. And I just moved to the City of Toronto, um, like July 1st of 2020. And I thought this is gonna be like a great way to meet people, to get involved in the community, to develop my idea. Um, and to really like develop a network in, in this place that I hope to um, to live and work in in the future. And what was the experience like? I mean, it must have been pretty nerve wracking to kind of put yourself out there in front of um, all these, you know, amazing other amazing women. Were you were you nervous? What was the experience like for you? Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely nerve wracking. Um, what I what I enjoyed about uh, this particular group was that one where we were all women, we are we are all women or women identifying, and that made it a little bit less intimidating. Um, the other, um, like, so yeah, like it it wasn't kind of too bad, but it it was it did take some getting used to. You do have to learn how to put yourself out there. The sure. other thing is that my particular business is not tech based, and while well, some of the um, projects that were um, involved in the Women for Climate TO program were tech based, it wasn't all across the board, um, and that that was nice because I'm often involved in conversations where I'm the only non tech startup um, that's involved. So it's nice to have that kind of um, networking camaraderie with other non tech startups. Yeah, and you're also, you know, waste management is typically very male dominated. Um, what has the experience been like for you in, you know, in, in that way? Is, have you noticed that or is that something that does come into it when you're talking about waste management and especially a solution for, for waste management? Yeah, it's very interesting that you say that because we, there, there is such a dichotomy between the industries that um, we work in how we define one as male and female. So while okay. waste management is very typically defined as a male dominated industry, sustainability and conscious eco-conscious living is almost seen as feminine. Fair so um, it, it, it is interesting kind of um, dealing with both of those different kind of personalities and people, because I do need to deal with both. I need people who have that larger vision of we want to work towards the future. Sure. And also the people that are kind of hands on on the ground dealing with um, uh, trash on a daily basis, but it, it 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 takes a lot of getting used to. I remember one call that I had when I was just starting out. I was calling manufacturers, and uh, I remember someone saying to me, "Like, you know, this costs money, right?" Like, <laughs> as if I was if you didn't had know no that. idea. Yeah, like very patronizing in some cases. So you, you do have to learn to just brush it off and say they're they're not getting my business done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Bye, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we, we live in such a consumer driven society. I mean, waste is a big issue and it's an issue because of how um how much stuff that we buy on a regular basis. What do you think it'll take for people to to understand that when they purchase something that it it, it does end up somewhere? Uh, I think there's a real disconnect between um between where our stuff comes from and ultimately where our stuff ends up. What do you think will change that? And are we at that kind of precipice right now where we are starting to see more of that change? Yeah, one way that we can see that change, um, or it, I, I definitely understand what you're saying. I live in a condo in, in Toronto and when I dispose of my waste, I put it in the garbage chute and it's out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Um, but something that we we can do and we can look at is really tangible benefits of disposing of our waste properly rather than looking at the negative impact maybe associated with it. So proper waste disposal is going to um, look like cleaner air for the city of Toronto because eight to nine percent of greenhouse gas emissions in Toronto are tied to landfills. Exactly. Um, yeah. So we can really start like rather than focusing on or not rather than, but in addition to focusing on the path of where your waste is going, think about the impacts of what your waste diversion is doing. And that's just one of many examples. 
so it's it's kind of spinning it to let people know that this will benefit your health or this will benefit the health of the you know of the air as an example that you used and and that's a better way to kind of approach it i i suppose than saying stop buying so much stuff and um it's a, it's a better way to approach it for sure potentially i think that like both are definitely needed people need to know that they they shouldn't be buying single use plastics and thankfully we have some legislation coming into place for that because it it's sometimes inevitable especially when we do start talking about marginalized identities and people who are of a lower socioeconomic status that does really come into play when you're telling people to to reduce what they're consuming. Yeah, for sure. What do you think a program like this means to women in general? Um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great platform for women to get their ideas heard. What I really enjoyed um, about this particular program was it was a program nested in an additional program. So there's, um, for instance, a Women for Climate Montreal, a Women for Climate Vancouver, I believe LA. Um, there's a few in Italy and Australia, for instance. So I was able to um, like look up a, a bunch of different uh, Women for Climate mentee projects um, and, and just see the impacts that they're having in their local community. Because even though someone is part of this Women for Climate in Australia, their ideas can have massive impacts here in Canada as well. So they're leaders in their in their local community, but they're creating massive impact in their global community. So just uh, getting that awareness out of who these women are and uh, really that they're, they're leaders and they need to be amplified, lifted up and celebrated. And you're one of them for sure. So tell me about your goals for Still Solutions. So here we are on Earth Day 2021. Um, where do you see your business in, let's say, five years from now and 10 years from now? Right. So um, one of Ontario's goals, uh, the Ontario government's goals, is to become accessible by 2025. Um, that's 20 years after we implemented our provincial accessibility legislation, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Um, I, I would love to see Wastefinder installed in as many locations across Ontario and certainly within the city of Toronto as possible. Um, accessibility and sustainability don't, um, don't respect uh, um, borders. So um, if you're sustainable in one location, um, it, uh, it, it's going to have a positive impact in, in various other locations. But if you're having a non-sustainable behavior, pr practicing a non-sustainable behavior, that's also going to have impact in, impacts in various locations. So my thinking is that we need to get waste finder in as many spaces as possible to, one, divert as much waste as possible, but to... Um, also enable as many people with vision loss, people with disabilities, et cetera, to be part of that process and to contribute to their community's positive, sustainable development. Yeah, that's wonderful. What about some advice for women thinking about applying um, to the next cohort uh, of Women for Climate TO? Um, I would say that like you're, you're gonna get exactly what you put into the program. And by that, I mean, um, how about a clear outline of what you do want to achieve throughout the program? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you're going to be paired with uh, an incredible mentor. Um, outline exactly what you want from that particular relationship. So something that I did, for instance, with one of my mentors was I said, I, I have this business meeting come up. I'm really nervous about it. Can we, can we have a meeting and walk through what I'm going to say if they say this, what I'm going to say if they say that? Um, if you need uh, to access additional help or services, there is office hours. Um, if you wanted to really engage in the networking component with other uh, mentees in the program, that was um, something that you needed to really initiate. So th there are some great members of the group. We had some of our own social events in addition to the networking events. So um, definitely a worthwhile program to, to be a part of. Um, I think especially once uh, this pandemic is over, once things have settled down, it would be an even greater program to have in person. Yeah, totally. What did you learn about yourself through this whole experience? Good question. <laughs> um, 
I, I think I like I need to ask for exactly what what I want. I, um, and, and that goes to the question that you just asked, asked that you're going to get out of the program exactly what you put into it. So I, I knew what I wanted out of the program. I knew the things that I wanted out of it. Um, and, and that's really helped me often. Um, women are told or taught to be a bit more timid. Um, and especially when you're kind of in that uh, founder or entrepreneur sphere, um, the hustle culture is um, can be overwhelming. So just kind of asking for exactly what I need and if I can get it, then that's great. But if I can't, then finding a solution to move forward, that's something that I'm going to uh, take definitely into my business practices and um, work culture in the future. I think that's great advice. I think, um, you know, myself included, I think sometimes women do have trouble, um, especially in a, in a, in a male dominated um, society asking for, for what they want. So, I mean, your advice is basically just to go for it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah. How do we get more young people involved in the sustainability movement? I, you know, we've seen, we have seen quite a movement uh, last year before COVID, you know, with Greta Thunberg. Um, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've certainly seen a massive shift. And I think social media and just the online community has really helped to push the agenda. And it's it's a much younger platform. So you see a lot of younger people. But we still don't have enough people. What do you think it's going to take to get kind of everybody on board, reducing waste and, and doing the, you know, doing what we need to do to reduce climate emissions and, and to, you know, make the planet a better place, basically, for us right now, never mind the future, for us right now. Yeah, there's yeah. Um, definitely a lot of things that you can do, especially with kids. A lot of kids are already fully on board and they might not know it. So celebrating um, when they do recycle and providing positive affirmations for when they do um, maybe uh, give someone the same guy for not picking up their waist or something. Um, just just giving giving them like a, a a pat on the back for acknowledging what sustainable behaviors are. But on top of that, we definitely need to implement um, policies and legislation. This is um, a much bigger issue than the individual. Yeah. What I'm hoping to do with Waste Finder is enable individuals to recycle properly so that the cities and municipalities that are then responsible for managing the waste um, can manage it in the most effective way possible. They can't do that if the waste is ending up in uh, a different stream or on the street. Yeah, so, exactly. Mm -hmm. Is it something you could see? You could see your your um, solution in schools. With that, is that something? Is that something that you you would be hopeful for? Is it more um, businesses, that kind of stuff, corporations? Yeah. So I'm a big believer in the fact that accessibility, basically, for something to be accessible, it needs to be everywhere. People with disabilities don't exist in certain environments. Um, we're not kind of. Uh, we, 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 like everyone else, would like to go everywhere. Um, and with that in mind, we want the spaces that we go into to be accessible regardless of where they are, whether that's in a school, an old folks home on the sidewalk or at a Tim Horton. So definitely planning to work with schools, but also um, just because that, that is a great place for kids to learn and get really excited about um, recycling and seeing the impacts of it um, and, uh, then taking that home with them. Kids are great educators for their parents as well. Um, and yeah, I, I, I just think that it, that would also be a great place to, to have them. Have you always been an environmentalist? Is it, is it something that you kind of, it, you know, you mentioned that this began as a school project, but was it something that you were interested in as a, as a younger person, um, as a child yourself, or did you just kind of fall into it naturally later on? Um, I, I've always, uh, I think, defined myself as someone who's very passionate about the environment. Um, once I lost my vision, however, um, in 2016, I was no longer able to simply participate in very easy tasks such as proper waste disposal. So it was almost as if when it was suddenly taken away from me, my ability to be an environmental steward or steward of the environment, um, that I became uh, frustrated and um, empowered to to address this issue. Uh, 
you, you don't really notice how, how valuable something is, even if it's just a behavior until you can't do it. And you've done such an in, in, incredible job. Um, we're going to wrap things up in just a few minutes, but if you could um, give us some advice, just kind of, you know, to, to wrap things up, what would be your, you know, your, your biggest advice um, for people that want to get involved in sustainability in general? So not, not so much um, a competition, um, but just in, in wanting to do something good for their environment or for their community rather. Yeah, um, I, I think definitely recognizing that the responsibility is not all on I mean, all of us as individuals necessarily to to create change, but some of the responsibility is. Um, and with that in mind, um, very very simple everyday tasks that you can do contribute to a more sustainable environment. So um, taking your refillable water bottle um, over. Uh, a plastic bottle, for instance, it is going to save a significant amount of energy or um, getting, for instance, uh, just recycling a, uh, an aluminum can will be able to power a, a laptop for a, a approximately two hours. So there's a lot of impact that can happen with individual actions. And don't think that you need to fully dive into it, getting all the zero waste products and you no know, packaging and doing those zero waste challenges. If, if it's too intimidating you need to do that right off the bat, individual actions still really matter. Yeah, I always tell people do what you can with what you have. It's not about buying the latest, hottest, trendiest sustainable item. Um, it, it is really, you can also shop your shop your home. Um, people always say to me, oh, you know, I, I get this quite a bit in my, in my, you know, 20 years doing this is that, oh, one person, you know, can't make a difference, but I, I think they can, and I would love you to just kind of end on that is, is one person can absolutely make a difference and you're, you really are an example of that. Thank you. Yeah, one person can definitely make a difference um, because what we're, what we're trying to do is still solutions as we're trying to create a chain reaction of getting other people involved. Um, if everyone said that not like my, my individual contribution to the environment won't make a difference. If everyone said that, or even if a million people said that, the, the amount of waste that would be generated, the amount of energy that would be created, the amount of um, uh, pollution, for, et cetera, et cetera, that would be created continues to grow. So um, it, your, your impacts, whether positive or negative, still have an impact. And it's really empowering, um, I think, once you understand that to really employ it in your everyday practices because it can be rewarding. But again, you also do need to recognize that um, our, our power is, is as a collective. So individual actions are strong when they're done together. Absolutely. They all add up, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, congratulations again, Hillary. It's so well Thank deserved. You. I'm so excited to see um, your uh business grow and flourish and thank you of course to all the speakers that joined us tonight um and to all of you for supporting the women for climate mentorship program earth day celebration thank you again hillary and for more information go to livegreentoronto.ca and i hope all of you have a wonderful night and a big congrats to you once again hillary thank you so much